Questions to the Prime Minister, Mr Craig Tracy. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. At the last Prime Minister's questions before Armistice Day, I know the whole House will join me in paying tribute to all those who have fallen serving our country. They gave their lives so we could live ours in freedom. And it's right to pause and reflect every year on Armistice Day, also on the contribution of all those who serve our country. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr Craig Tracy. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'd like to associate myself with the Prime Minister's comments and look forward to joining the the Armistice Day Parade in bed within my constituency, which has been in existence since 1921 and grown to be the largest in Britain. And on the point of the military, speaking to constituents in North Warwickshire, the government commitment of 2% of GDP spending was very welcome. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that, given the volatile state of many parts of the world, it is more important than ever that we maintain that commitment and give our brave troops the support, resources and equipment available? I think my honourable friend is absolutely right. We do live in a very dangerous and uncertain world. And I think these key commitments that we've made, the 2% on defence spending throughout this Parliament, the 0.7% on aid spending, which helps our security, as well as making sure we are a generous and moral nation, and also, crucially, having the ultimate insurance policy of a replacement for our Trident submarines. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I concur with the, I concur with the Prime Minister's I concur with the Prime Minister's remarks concerning Remembrance Sunday and Remembrance Weekend. We mourn all those that have died in all wars, and surely we also resolve to try and build a peaceful future where the next generation doesn't suffer from the wars of past generations. Last week, I asked the Prime Minister the same question six times, Mr Speaker, and he couldn't answer. He's now had a week to think about it. I want to ask him one more time. Can he guarantee that next April nobody is going to be worse off as a result of cuts to working tax credits? Let me be absolutely clear with the Honourable Gentleman. What I can guarantee next April is there will be an 11,000 personal allowance, so you can earn £11,000 before you pay tax. What I can guarantee is there will be a national living wage at £7.20, giving the lowest paid in our country a £20 a week pay rise compared with the election next year. Now, on the issue of tax credits, we suffered the defeat in the House of Lords, so we've taken the proposals away. We are looking at them. We will come forward with new proposals in the autumn statement, and at that point, in exactly three weeks' time, I'll be able to answer his question. Now, if he wants to spend the next five questions asking it all over again, I'm sure he'll find that uh, it is very entertaining and interesting. How it fits with the new politics, I'm not quite sure. But uh, over to you. Mr Speaker, this isn't about entertainment. This is about... This... This is not funny for people who are desperately worried about what's going to happen next April. If the Prime Minister won't listen to the questions I put, won't listen to the questions that are put by the public, then perhaps the Prime Minister will listen to a question that was raised by his honourable friend, the member for Brigham Gould, who last week concerning tax credit changes said, and I quote, the changes cannot go ahead next April and that any mitigation should be full mitigation. What's the Prime Minister's answer to his friend? (laughs) It's very much the same answer that I gave to him. (laughs) In in three weeks' time, we will announce our proposals and he will be able to see what we'll do to deliver the high-pay, low-tax, lower-welfare economy we want to see. That's what we need in our country. We're cutting people's taxes, we're increasing people's pay, but we also believe it's right to reform welfare. So he'll have his answer in three weeks' time. But meantime, he has to think about this. If we don't reform welfare, how are we going to fund the police service that we're talking about today? 
are we going to fund the health service that we could be talking about today? How are we going to pay for the defence forces that we're talking about today? The honourable gentleman has been completely consistent. He's opposed every single reform to welfare that has ever come forward. If we'd listen to him, you'd still have families in London getting £100,000 a year in housing benefit. So the answer to the question is, you'll find out in three weeks' time. Carry on. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The reality is that the Prime Minister makes choices, and he's made a choice concerning working tax credits, which hasn't worked very well for so far. But he must be aware. I give him an example. A serving soldier, a private in the army with two children and a partner, would lose over £2,000 next April. I ask a question. The questions will be heard and the answers will be heard. Simple as that. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Surely that is the whole point of our Parliament, that we are able to put questions to those in authority. And so I have a question from I have a I have a question from Kieran, a veteran of the first Gulf War. His family are set to lose out, and he writes, It's a worry to the family, there's fear and trepidation about whether we're going to be able to get by. And he asks, Is this how the government treats veterans of the armed services? Well, well, first of all, let me take the case of the serving soldier. First of all, many soldiers, indeed I think all soldiers, will benefit from the £11,000 personal allowance that comes in next year. That means they'll be able to earn more money before they even start paying taxes. Serving soldiers that have children will benefit from the 30 hours of childcare. And of course, serving soldiers and others will be able to see our proposals on tax credits in exactly three weeks' time. But what I would say to the serving soldier is that he is now dealing with an opposition party, the leader of which said he couldn't see any use for UK forces anywhere in the world at any time. That serving soldier wouldn't have a job if the honourable gentleman ever got anywhere near power. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I invite the Prime Minister to cast his mind to another area of public service that is causing acute concern at the present time. I note he's trying to dig himself out of a hole with the junior doctor's uh, offer this morning, which we await the detail of. But there is a question that I want to put to him, and I quote Dr Cliff Mann, the President of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, who said, this winter will be worse than last winter. And last winter was the worst winter we've ever had in the NHS. Can the Prime Minister guarantee there will be no winter crisis in the NHS this year? Uh, First of all, when it comes to the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, they actually support what we're saying about a seven-day NHS and the junior doctor's contract. He says, wait for the detail. I would urge everyone in this House, and I'd urge all junior doctors who are watching this, to go on the Department of Health website and look at the pay calculator, because you'll be able to see there that no one working legal hours will lose out in any way at all. This is an 11 per cent basic pay rise, and what it will deliver is a stronger and safer NHS. Now, as for the state of our NHS more generally, it is benefiting from £10 billion that we put in, money that the Labour Party at the last election said they did not support. So I believe the NHS has the resources that it needs, and that's why we're seeing it treating more patients with more treatments, more drugs being delivered, more tests being carried out. It's a much stronger NHS, and the reason is simple, because we have a strong economy supporting our strong NHS. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I note that the Prime Minister has not offered any comment whatsoever about the winter crisis of last year or what will happen this year. Now, 
there is. There is. Mr. Speaker. Oh, order. Oh, order. The Leader of the Opposition is entitled to ask questions without a barrage of noise. And the Prime Minister is entitled to answer questions without a barrage of noise. That is what the public is entitled to expect. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, if the Prime Minister won't answer questions that I put, then I quote to him the renowned King's Fund, which has enormous expertise in NHS funding and NHS administration, and I quote, the National Health Service cannot continue to maintain standards of care and balance the books. A rapid and serious decline in patient care is inevitable unless something is done. Can I ask the Prime Minister, which is rising faster, NHS waiting lists or NHS deficits? Well, first of all, let me, let me deal directly uh, with the, the King's Fund. What we've done on this side of the House is appoint a new Chief Executive to the NHS, Mr Simon Stevens, who worked under the last Labour government and did a very good job for them. He produced the Stevens plan that he said required at least £8 billion of government funding, and we're putting in £10 billion behind that plan. That is the plan that we're producing, and the results you can see is that we've got 1.3 million more operations, 7.8 million more more outpatient appointments, 4.7 million more diagnostic tests. What is going up in the NHS is the number of treatments, is the number of successful outcomes. And if he wants to know who is heading for a winter crisis, I would predict that it's the Labour Party that is heading for a winter crisis. We've seen it in a lot. Look at his appointments. Look at his appointments. His media advisor is a Stalinist. His, his new policy advisor is a Trotskyist. And his economic advisor is a communist. If he's trying to move the Labour Party to the left, I'd give him full marks. Mr Speaker, the issue that I raised with the Prime Minister was the National Health Service, in case he'd forgotten. I'd just like to remind him that since he took office in 2010, the English waiting list is up by a third. There are now 3.5 million people, 3.5 million people waiting for treatment in the NHS. If this party can't match its uh, actions by its words, then I put this to him: Will he just get real? The NHS is in a problem. It's in a problem of deficits in many hospitals. It's in a problem of waiting lists. It's in a problem of the financial crisis that's been faced with so many others. Can he now address that issue and ensure that everyone in this country can rely on the NHS, which is surely the jewel in all of our crowns? He talks about the health service since I became Prime Minister. Let me tell him what has happened in the NHS since I became Prime Minister. The number of doctors up by 10,500. The number of nurses up by 5,800. Fewer patients waiting more than 52 weeks to start treatment than under Labour. And we've introduced the Cancer Drugs Fund. And we've seen mixed sex wards virtually abolished. And we've seen rates of MRSA and hospital acquired infection come plummeting down. That's what's happened. But it's happened for a reason because we've had a strong economy, because we've got some of the strongest growth anywhere in the world, because we've got unemployment coming down, because we've got inflation on the floor, we're able to fund an NHS. Whereas the countries he admires all over the world, with their crazy socialist plans, cut their health service and hurt the people that need the help the most. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The UK's internet economy is by far the largest of the G20 nations at 12.4% of our GDP. But as consumers move online, so do criminals. So does the Prime Minister agree that the Investigatory Powers Bill must give our security services the powers they need to keep us safe, whilst ensuring that proper controls exist 
on how we use those powers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this, and I think it's one of the most important bills that this House uh, will discuss. It's obviously going through pre-legislative scrutiny first. The Home Secretary today at this dispatch box will set out very, very clearly what this bill is about, why it's necessary. Let me just make one simple point. Communications data, the who called who and when, of uh, telecommunications has been absolutely vital in catching rapists and child abductors and solving other crimes. And the question before us is, do we need that data when people are using social media to commit those crimes rather than just a fixed or mobile phone? My answer is yes. We must help the police and our security and intelligence services to keep us safe. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, at this week's remembrance events, we remember all of the sacrifices from past and present conflicts. We also show our respects to veterans and to service families. Does the Prime Minister agree that everything, everything must be done to deliver on the military covenant, both the spirit and the letter? I certainly agree with both parts of his question. These remembrance services are very important right up and down our country. And the military covenant, I think, is one of the most important things that we have, where we make a promise to our military that because of the sacrifices they make on our behalf, they should not have less good treatment than other good people in our country. And indeed, where we can, we should provide extra support. This is the first government to put the military covenant properly into law and to deliver almost every year big improvements in the military covenant, whether it's hospital treatment, whether it's uh, uh, free transport, whether it is council tax discount, and so many other things, and we report on it every year. Mr Angus Robertson. <coughs> However, is the Prime Minister aware that many, many service widows continue to be deprived of their forces' pensions if there is a change in their personal circumstances? Does he agree that this is a clear breach in the spirit of the military covenant? And what will he do to rectify this wrong? Well, we made a big change, I think it was last year, at around the time of Armistice Day, to make sure that many um, people who had uh, remarried were able to get their pensions, and that was a very big step forward, welcomed by the British Legion. If there are further steps that we need to take or need to look at, I'm very happy to look at them and see what can be done. I also remember that in the last budget, I think it was, we looked at the case of uh, police widows, and we tried to put right their situation as well. Dr James Davis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating the town of Prostatin in my constituency, which is a finalist in the DCLG Great British High Street Awards? And will he confirm whether the UK Government will be holding discussions with the Welsh Assembly Government about the devolution of business, council, business rates to councils in Wales so that other town centres in my constituency, such as Rill, have a better opportunity to regenerate? Yeah. Well, I certainly uh, join him in congratulating Prestatin. I don't know whether Prestatin is in the same category for this prize as uh, my hometown of Chipping Norton, which has also been nominated, so uh, I might have some conflicts of interest. But what I, um, what I would say to him is, obviously, in Wales, uh, business rates is a devolved issue, but it is open to the Welsh Government, should they choose, to take the approach that we're taking of devolving that business rate income directly to local councils so that local councils have a better connection between the money that they raise and the decisions that they make to attract business and investment and industry to their area. McTaggart. Mr Speaker, I went to Cheltenham Ladies College, the Prime Minister to Eton. Both schools... Both schools which invest heavily in excellent teaching and facilities for music, dance, arts, drama. Yet while he has been Prime Minister, the schools which educate 93% of our pupils have cut teachers in those subjects. Will his legacy be that Britain stops being a world leader in creative and cultural industries and becomes an also-ran? No, I, I don't accept that. And actually, if you look at what's happened with school funding, it's actually been protected uh, under this government, and we want to continue protecting school funding. What I would make no apology for is the very clear focus that we have on getting the basics right in our schools. I think it's absolutely essential that we get more children learning the basic subjects, getting the basic qualifications, and then on top of that, it's, it's then more possible, I would argue, to put in place the arts, the dance and the drama that I want my children to have as they go to their schools. 
Damien Collins. The, uh, the Channel Tunnel and the Port of Dover are major pieces of national infrastructure, but when there are big disruptions to services, it causes chaos on Kent's roads. As the Government completes its final work on the spending review, will, uh, will the Prime Minister give special consideration to the need for an urgent and long-term solution to Operation Stack? Now, I absolutely recognise the serious problems that were caused to Kent residents and businesses when it becomes necessary to put into place Operation Stack. We have already implemented short-term measures to reduce the impact, including using the temporary availability of Manston uh, airfield as a contingency measure. I know that he met this morning with the Chancellor of the Exchequer with other Kent MPs, and we are happy to try and build on this work. I understand the pressures, and we will do everything we can to relieve them. David Anderson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the comments the Prime Minister made about what will happen this weekend and also his comments he made the Leader of the SNP? Can I raise with him the issue about the fact that thousands of people who served our nation, particularly in the Royal Navy, but served before 1987, not entitled to full compensation? This means that people who have been exposed to asbestosis and have contracted the, the cancer disease mesothelioma stand to lose out massively when compared with people in civilian life, to the extent that someone who has been exposed to the industry could get £150,000 in compensation, and it is probable that uh, a service person will only get £31,000. Could he look into this report back this House, because this is clearly a moral outrage, as well as being a clear breach of the military commons? Well, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for raising this issue. I understand that the Defence Secretary is looking at it. As I've said, since putting in place the Military Covenant into law, we've tried every year to try and make progress, whether on the issue of widows, whether on the issue of particular groups who've been disadvantaged in some way, and I'm very happy to go away and look at the points that he makes. Stephen Metcalf. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Royal Society have identified the need for one million scientists, engineers and tech professionals by 2020. One way to bridge this skills gap is through an increase in high-quality apprenticeships, such as delivered by ProCat in Basildon. Yay! However, for every one place available, 20 people apply. Will my right honourable friend redouble his efforts to meet our commitment to three million new apprenticeships? Yay! My friend is right. This three million target is essential, and I believe we can achieve it. But going back to the honourable member for Slough's questions, one of the ways we will achieve it is making sure that more of our young people have the qualifications necessary to apply for an apprenticeship. What many firms find is that lots of people apply, but when you knock out the people who haven't got a qualification in English and maths, the number comes right down. And I'm delighted to announce today that in terms of my advisor on apprenticeships, to try and make sure that we really work with businesses to get this three million, the right hon the honourable member for Stratford-on-Avon is going to take the place of the member for Watford, who's moved on to other things, and he's going to help me, the member for Stratford to make sure we get businesses to deliver on this agenda. Gordon Marsden. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister realise my constituents in Blackpool face a double whammy on police cuts from his spending review, but also from the new Home Office formula, which chops 14 per cent, £25 million off Lancashire's police? So I ask him, with a cross-party letter from Lancashire's MPs, one from my neighbourhood watch group, one from our police commissioners and six others, mostly Tories, and our Chief Constable, all saying that this process is flawed, how many blue lights must he have before we hit meltdown? Well, first of all, let me say to him is that the reforms to the police funding formula are cons is a consultation on which no decisions have been taken. Can I, through him, congratulate the Lancashire Police because crime is down in Blackpool by 5 per cent uh, over the Parliament? Uh, funding for Lancashire Police is £180 million, which is the same in cash terms as 2003. And I re re record to him that Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary, and I quote, found that Lancashire Constabulary is exceptionally well prepared to face its future financial requirements. That's the view of HMIC. And in a world, in a country where crime, however you measure it, has fallen significantly since this government took office. Yeah. Is Anne Marie Trebellia? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. constituent, Dr Sarah Pape, one of the UK's leading burn specialists, went out on Monday to Bucharest to help the Romanian medical teams dealing with the nightclub fire disaster. I understand that there are some 150 patients in need of critical burns care and only 25 burns bed in Bucharest. 
Sarah Pape has asked if the Prime Minister will consider offering practical humanitarian medical assistance to these burns victims by allowing the use of UK burns facilities for their treatment. Well, well, first of all, I think my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this tragic event that took place in Bucharest last Friday, and all our thoughts are with the victims and their families. I'm pleased to hear about Dr Pape's visit and her selfless work to help. I think it's a very good suggestion to look at whether we can offer specialist help and support, and I'll take that away and see what can be done. Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will understand the heartbreak at the death of a child. For parents then not to know what's happened to the ashes of that child, as is the case with Mike and Tina Trohill in Hull and other families up and down the country, must be simply very cruel. Will the Prime Minister agree to meet with Mike and Tina to discuss why we need national and a local inquiry as to what happened in that case around baby ashes? Well, of course, I completely understand how her constituents feel. This must have been an absolutely tragic event, and, as she says, only made worse by not knowing uh, what has happened to, to their child. I'm very happy to arrange that uh, meeting. Let me, I, I'm not aware of this case. I hadn't heard of it before. Let me look at it very carefully and see what I can do. Mr Kevin Hollinray. Yeah. Yeah. I was delighted that the Chancellor ch- chose our county city of York to launch the new National Infrastructure Commission. Could the Prime Minister confirm that this is the start of a new era where important investment decisions, such as roads and railways, between the greatest cities in the north will bring, help bring growth and prosperity to our region? Yeah. My, my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this. Uh, uh, people in, in Yorkshire have long felt that there hasn't been a fair enough deal in terms of transport funding on roads and on rail, and I think people can now see that there is £13 billion being spent on transport in the north as part of our plan to rebalance Britain's economy. We have committed over £4.8 billion of major road improvements. We are continuing to invest in improving the A64, which is absolutely vital for the, the people of York, and we will go on looking at what more we can do to make sure this vital part of the economy has the transport links it needs. John Nicholson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On the 9th of September, the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport said to the DCMS Select Committee, and I quote, there are no plans to sell Channel 4. Can the Prime Minister confirm that remains the Government's position, that no discussions are underway to privatise and thus imperil this much-loved and important public institution. Well, 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 first of all, um, let me let me say I'm a huge fan of Channel 4, and Channel 4 was a great Conservative innovation. Uh, I think it was a combination of Willie Whitelaw and Margaret Thatcher that helped to bring Channel 4 to our screens, um, and I'm a huge fan. I want to make sure I want to make sure that Channel 4 has a strong and secure future, and I think it's right to look at all of the options, including to see whether private investment into Channel 4 could help safeguard it for the future. Let's have a look at all the options. Let's not close our minds, like some uh, on the opposition front bench, who think that, that you know private is bad and public is good. Let's have a proper look at how we can make sure this great channel goes on being great for many years to come. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Everybody who's had any contact with the adoption process will be familiar with the frustration that unnecessary delays cause to prospective parents. Will the Prime Minister take action to speed up the adoption process so that more children can be put with the right yeah. families much more quickly. Yeah. No, well, I, my honourable friend is absolutely right to, to raise this. We have seen a 72% increase in the number of children adopted. The average waiting time has come down something like five months, but it's still far too long. And if you look across the 150 different councils responsible for adoption, you can see that around 68 of them don't have any mechanisms for what we call early placement, where you actually run fostering and adoption alongside each other and if we can introduce that not least through our regional adoption agencies that we'll be establishing we'll see many more children get the warm and loving home that we want them to have all flynn will he spare a thought on armistice day for the 633 of our bravest and best who died as a result of two political mistakes 179 in pursuit of non-existent weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and 454 who died in the Helmand incursion 
that promised that no shot would be fired? Will he think, is, will he rethink his own plan to order more of our brave soldiers to put their lives on the line in the chaos and confusion of a four-sided civil war in Syria? I have great respect for the Honourable Gentleman, but, but with respect, I would suggest that on Armistice Day we should put aside political questions about conflicts and decisions that were made, and we should simply remember the men and women who put on a uniform, go and serve, and risk their lives on our behalf. Let's make Armistice Day about that and not about other questions. Steve Double. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The last week has been a very good week for Cornwall Airport in Newquay, with the, scrapping, uh, the announcement of the scrapping of the airport development fee, which was an additional tax, tax on passengers and a barrier to growth, the announcement of new uh, air links that uh, link Cornwall directly to main, mainland Europe, and the upgrading of the Gatwick link with the support of the PSO. Would the Prime Minister uh, uh, join me in congratulating the team at Newquay Airport for their excellent work in supporting the Cornish economy? Yeah. I'm a, a huge fan of Newquay Airport and a frequent user, and the government made a series of promises about helping Newquay Airport to make sure that vital connectivity between Cornwall and the rest of the country, and indeed continental Europe, is there, and I'm delighted it's doing so well. Mr Norman Lamb. Uh, can, I, uh, can I thank the Prime Minister for his welcome uh, to the... Uh, this order. I want to hear this question. Mr Lamb. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I, can I thank the Prime Minister for his welcome uh, for the campaign launched this week, where over 200 leaders from across society uh, joined the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Sutton Coalfield, uh, Alistair Campbell, and me in calling for equality for those who suffer from mental ill health? The truth, the truth is that those who suffer from mental ill health do not have the same right to access treatment as others enjoy in our NHS. The moral and the economic case for ending this historic injustice is overwhelming. Will the Prime Minister do what it takes to ensure that this spending review delivers the investment, extra investment in mental health to deliver genuine equality? Yeah. Well, well, let me say to the Honourable Gentleman, who did a lot of work on this in the last Parliament, I very much welcome the campaign that has been launched and what they want to achieve. We set out in the NHS Constitution parity between mental and physical health, and we've taken steps towards that by, for instance, introducing for the first time waiting times and proper targets for talking therapies. And there are, I think now, twice as many people undergoing those talking therapies as there were five years ago. But I completely accept there's more to do in, in healing this divide between mental and physical health, and this government is committed to do that. Sir Andrew Mitchell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Further to the question from the Right Honourable Gentleman for Norfolk North, may I thank the Prime Minister for his support and emphasise that this is indeed an all-party campaign. Does he agree with me that there is a real opportunity now to build on the work of the Coalition over the last five years and with widespread support across all parts of society and an historic injustice between the inequality, the treatment between mental health and a physical illness. Yeah, very good. Well, I, I think my honourable friend is absolutely right. Let me tell him what we're actually doing. We're investing more in mental health than ever before. We'll be spending 11.4 billion this financial year, and crucially, that we have asked every clinical commissioning group to ensure real terms increases in their investment in mental health services. So it can't be treated as the Cinderella service that has sometimes been the case in the past. And I think if we do that and also deal with some of the other issues, such as mental health uh, patients being held in police cells inappropriately, we can have a far better system for dealing with mental health in our country. Mr Nigel Dodds. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, with the announcement yesterday of the loss of 860 manufacturing jobs uh, in Ballymena at the Michelin plant, and one of the factors being high energy costs, will the Prime Minister undertake to work with the Northern Ireland Executive to address both the short-term and medium-term issues as a matter of urgency, and for people that are currently in work in Northern Ireland and who are extremely worried about the impact of cutting working tax credits, yeah, yeah, yeah. given that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor and the Government are in listening mode and are showing a surprising degree of flexibility across a range of issues currently, will the Prime Minister reverse the thrust of that policy and remove the burden and threat 
against working families in Northern Ireland and across the country? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, on the issue of uh, industries, if a company qualifies as part of the energy intensive industries, it will see a reduction uh, in its bill because of uh, the action that I announced from this dispatch box last week. The second point I'd make specifically to, to Northern Ireland is we have passed in this House historic legislation to allow Northern Ireland to set its own rate of corporation tax. And the sooner we can put together all of the elements of the Stormont House agreement, then the sooner Northern Ireland will be able to take action to try and build a stronger private sector in Northern Ireland, which is exactly what I want to see. On the issue of tax credits, I give him the same answer. He'll, he'll know in three weeks' time, but he also knows that people who work in that business or in other businesses will be able to earn £11,000 before they start paying taxes, get more help with their childcare, and have a higher wage to start with. Let's build an economy where you earn more, pay less taxes, and we keep welfare costs under control so we can bu build great public services. Yeah. Order!